Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments. For tonight, we're going to look at doing problems that matter. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI technology to make those tough to teach, tough to learn concepts accessible to all my students. With us tonight, we have three panelists, Gail Burrell, Tom Dick, and Curtis Brown. Currently as currently an academic specialist in the program for mathematics ed at Michigan State University, Gail was a secondary math teacher in Milwaukee for over 28 years. She served as president of NCTM and the International Association for Statistical Education. Her awards include the Presidential Award for Excellence in Teaching Math, the NCTM Lifetime Achievement Award, the Ross Taylor Glenn Gilbert NCSM Service Award, and Gail is a Senior Mathematics Advisor currently for Texas Instruments. So Gail, it's great to have you with us. And Tom is a Senior Math Advisor for Texas Instruments as well, and is also a Professor and former Chair of the Math Department at Oregon State University. He served on the editorial panels for the Journal for Research and Mathematics Education and the Mathematics Teacher Educator. He remains active in the College Board's AP Calculus program, and in 2008, Tom was inducted by the Oregon Council of Teachers of Mathematics into the Oregon Mathematics Education Hall of Fame. Tom, we're excited to have you with us tonight. It's great to be here with you all. Looking forward to it. And me too. I was reading Curtis's problem about the probability in the chat and forgot to say anything. So thanks. Thanks, Gail. And lastly, Curtis currently works as the math segment manager at Texas Instruments. He taught mathematics and AP statistics for several years. Since starting at TI in 2015, he's led many content development projects, including the Families of Functions video series. He's always found joy in exploring the patterns and logic of mathematics. In his spare time, he enjoys kayak fishing and mountaineering with his sons and spending time with his family. Curtis, thanks for joining us tonight. Super excited to be here tonight, Mike. Gail is going to kick off our agenda. So I'm really happy that you're all with us tonight. And we're going to talk about connecting math to the world around us. We're going to um, remind some of you that we did an earlier, um, Tom and I did an earlier webinar. We'll come back to that at the end. The agenda is really going to be three main problems, exploring the wage gap, using census data, and the game of hog. Um, followed by Mike closing up with some things. Over to Thanks, you. Gail. Yeah, we want you to stick around to the end because one lucky winner tonight is going to be receiving a TI graphing calculator. And Tom is going to discuss our expected outcomes. All right. Um, we're hoping as a result of uh, participating in this webinar, uh, you'll be able to identify some uh, interesting context for connecting math to the real world, find some ways that you can help your students experience different kinds of uh, optimization problems. Um, really appreciate and recognize the role that TI technology can play in making sense of data and identify strategies for incorporating what we call data science tasks into your own classes. Tom, thanks so much. Today we'll be using the chat window to send general messages, and as a reminder, the session is being recorded. We'll provide a link to the certificate of attendance at the inclusion of the webinar. All right, Curtis, so as I'm handing things over to you, uh, you can begin sharing your screen. And I just wanted to say that I, I thought I, as a math teacher of 17 years now, I thought I've done lots of problems that matter. So. Uh, maybe you can enlighten me tonight with some real problems that matter. Well, Mike, I'm pretty sure you probably have done some problems that matter. Uh, we're going to do some more tonight, though. I think uh, the problem sets 
uh, that we've got here tonight are going to be pretty exciting, interesting, um, engaging to students. And I think that's really what we mean by talking about problems that matter. Of course, uh, a couple of these are definitely problems that matter in contexts uh, even beyond the classroom. Um, but the intent, of course, is is certainly uh, around engagement for sure. Um, so Gail and Tom and I started this project quite a while ago. We've been filling uh, the TI website, uh, Math Inspired and 84 Activity Central, which we'll point you to uh, at the end of the webinar. We've been filling that with uh, some new activities around mathematical modeling. And we've uh, had a few design principles uh, for this project, um, thinking about real issues from real contexts. Uh, so pulling some of this data from uh, places that uh, are real, real live data, things that matter to students, uh, things that they care about or might be interested in. Um, we also are looking at doing these uh, from what makes sense to the students first. So sort of a, a, an informal approach before a formal uh, uh, definition or, or uh, a formal um, response. So we're really trying to kind of dive in and just let the kids play with data, try to figure some things out do things informally before they learn some of the more formal ways to do things. Um, also, the tied to that is the idea of delayed definitions. We're not coming in reading from the vocabulary. Uh, rather, we're, we're coming in and, and starting to do what seems to make most sense. Also, we tried to provide um, and are trying to provide some scaffolded steps for understanding, kind of pointing towards that idea of autom uh, automaticity. Man, that's a mouthful. I don't know who wrote this slide, but I'm going to have to have a conversation with them later. That's a hard thing to say, but the idea is that that uh, we're we're really trying to to build um, each step, each little uh, graph, or each little interaction uh, one upon another, and then finally, and I think maybe most importantly, thinking about the communication. Right? I mean, it's all fun and games, and and it's easy to to do some some cool mathematics, but until we can communicate out what we've learned and what we've seen and what we've kind of determined and then made made connections uh, back to the real world context. Um, we've just kind of done a little bit of hand waving. And so I think uh, really that last bullet is is a big, a big piece of of what we're trying to do uh, throughout these uh, throughout these activities. And so uh, without further ado, I'm going to just jump into the first uh, First context, and that is the idea of this, this gender salary gap. Um, it's been in the news quite a bit lately. You'll notice that all of my news articles are from last year. Um, that's mostly because I haven't updated these. It's continued to be uh, uh, an issue. It's continued to be something that uh, students talk about, um, and it and it does uh, turn up in the news uh, quite a bit. Um, and so I think it's of some interest then. Uh, to present our students with some data. So before I even jump in to playing with the data and doing things with technology um, in the chat, because I'm watching, um, I'd love for you guys to put in there some observations that you make. Now, I've only got uh, gender salary gap data here from the year 2000 up to 2019 and you will notice that there are two years that were repeated 2013 and 2017 uh, based upon uh, the type of data collection and some of the approximations that they had to make uh, they were changing the formula ever so slightly and so um, those two years have um, twice the amount of data uh, because they're calculated two different directions so uh, just heads up there earnings are in 2019 dollars and this is um from the Department of Labor. Labor. So, what are some things you guys notice? Just looking at the numbers. Um, I'm not seeing anything pop up here in the chat. Um, why did salary increase from 15 to 16? Okay. All right. It's a good question. There's a lot of different things. One of the first things that students. Uh, Ooh, women have made greater gains than men, but men still out out earn them by a large margin. Yeah, that's absolutely true. This is uh this is why this becomes a, a big conversation. 
Um, the gap does appear to be closing, at least in the numbers here. We're going to look at a picture of it here in just a second. One of the first things that um, that uh, students come up with or, or that teachers, even when they're kind of presented with this information, um, is they, they come up with this idea of can we compare the ratio of women's salaries to men's salaries? And just, just so we're all speaking the same language, this is median annual salary uh, regardless of uh, profession or any other category other than gender. So we're only looking at gender here, and this is the median salary for each of the two genders. So just making sure that we're all speaking the same language. All right, so one of the first things that, that students and, and teachers probably do is they wanna, they wanna make a conversation uh, about the ratio uh, between these two, and I think that's a, I think that's a really worthwhile task, and so we're going to dive into that really briefly. So, uh, one thing I have done is on my TI-84, I have stored that data into named lists, and so I have sent over my data into some named lists: uh, year, women, men, and I've also got uh, some data in here based upon race. If we get to that part, we'll. We'll we'll try to dive in and, and do something with that. So let's just let's go into the stat uh, menu here, and I'm going to go into edit list one. And on the top of list one, I'm actually going to compute this ratio um, by pressing alpha and the xt theta n key in my TI 84 plus CE. I get that fraction here, and I'm going to compare the data in the women's list. Okay, so I'm going to get the women's ratio uh, to men. So I'm gonna take that uh, data again for men and drop it in here and compute that ratio really quickly. Um, and in my list one, as that computes, now I have each of those cells, each of those years, um, year on year, and I can make uh, a graph of that data by doing a second stat plot. And I'm going to just jump down to uh, plot three because I've already sort of gotten it uh, pre made here. Uh, it is for full time workers just by uh, just by uh, answering your question there. Um, so I'm going to do this years versus that ratio that's in list one, and I'm just going to do zoom uh, nine. I'm not going to try to think too much uh, about this. And this sort of confirms what a lot of you guys uh, were talking about is, okay, so it does appear um, that this ratio is increasing. Now, the question begins, like, well, what do we want it to be? Where are we hoping that this, that this goes? And we can have that conversation with students a little bit and say, okay, are we making the progress we want to be making? Um, you can have some of that, that, type of the conversation here. And um, we could go through, and in fact, I will right now just show you, we're gonna, we're gonna make a, a regression line for this. So it might not pop up the first conversation. It might not be the first thing students think of, but uh, some students may. And so let's think about that. Let's actually make a, uh, a, a regression line for this. So we're gonna go over to stat. We're gonna go to calculate, and I'm just gonna pull up the linear regression. That's probably, uh, the first one and Y scale right now would be the ratio, Megan, just uh, heads up. We would be doing uh, the ratio of women's uh, salaries to men's salary. So it's really almost a unitless uh, Y uh, axis. So I'm going to pull up year versus list one because that's where my ratios are. And I'm going to store this in, uh, let's see, I want to store this in one of my uh, functions, maybe let's store it in Y4 um, just so I don't mess up any of my other data. So I'm going to plop that in there. Now we can talk about what this uh, slope is. All right. So um, A is my slope here. So it looks like we're gaining, boy, not very much every year. Uh, we're gaining about a, what, about a, a third of a percent uh, per year that women's salaries is increasing uh, compared to men's. That's uh, that's not very good. Um, I did the ratio by pressing uh, alpha 
and the x t theta n key, that gave me the fraction. So let's look at that graph. Um, we can plot that graph. There's our picture of what the uh, least squares regression line sort of looks like. Looks like we're making in the last 10 years some progress, which is good. Um, but uh, it's not growing as quickly as we want, probably. And ultimately, the question would be, hey, when are men's salaries equivalent to women's salaries? So how would we do that? It's not zero to one. I didn't. Uh, I didn't scale it from zero to one. We could certainly do that. And matter of fact, that's probably a good idea because right now, what I'm interested in doing is solving this for uh, when the men's salaries. I'm going to scale it just a little bit over so we can see it just a little bit better. But uh, if we do that, now you can kind of see it on a scale from zero to one. It doesn't look like we're making much progress, does it? Uh, it's uh, it's definitely interesting here that we're that we're not there all right so the question might be like when are we going to actually get men's salaries and women's salaries uh to be equivalent well i'm just going to pull up that solution we could go through and actually do that and we will here in just a minute but i graphed this on uh, another uh graph i'd plopped in y equals one and then i looked for that solution and it's way, 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 way out there. Uh, in 2077 is when this particular method seems to uh, predict that women's salaries will catch up to men's salaries. So then you have all kinds of conversations you could ask, like notice that the pink line continues beyond uh, the men's salaries there going above it. Do you think that's actually the way this is gonna work? uh is it really going to be linear all the way out there are the are the women's salaries really going to approach men's salaries in this model in this mode i don't know uh but that's worth a conversation it'd be interesting to have students uh check this out right so another way that students might be interested uh in trying to mess with this trying to play with this data would be linear systems right we could plot the men's against years and women's against years and so here's some typical solving systems of linear equations type scenarios um what might happen if we actually played with this data for men's uh salaries and women's salaries side by side so i've got the plot here i'm going to go turn it on on my calculator because i want to show you guys uh some things that we can do uh with this with this plot uh of data because i think this is a pretty interesting one um so i'm going to just plot the uh years versus men and do the same thing in plot two i'm going to pull up uh years versus women uh, I'm going to turn that one on and I'm going to turn plot three off because uh, I don't need that one on anymore. I'm going to turn that off here. Um, and I'm also going to go back to my Y equals menu and I'm just going to save us some time. I've already done the regressions uh, for us. I kind of showed you how to do that uh, a moment ago. So I'm going to turn off that other one and then let's zoom data on this one, zoom nine. All right. So. If we look at these two data plots, uh, and I think we could, I think, John, we could uh, look at this, is it exponential? We could explore some of the different types of models uh, if, if linear didn't seem to be an appropriate fit. It still seems to be fairly randomly scattered uh, about these two. But check this out. Let's look at the, um, let's look at the equations really quick. So just the men's or the women's salaries, uh, you'll notice that the slope for the women's salary is uh, at roughly $179 per year, right? So the women's salary is increasing at $179 per year. What do you notice about the men's salaries? Well, based on the 2000 to 2019 data, uh, it appears to be decreasing at roughly uh, $4.72 uh, per year. Now, this was an interesting thing because I just updated this data a couple of days ago uh, from working with the 2018 data. When I did the regression in 2018 data, the, when the men's salaries were actually decreasing at about $32 uh, a year. So that year 2019 certainly seems to have impacted uh, 
the way men's and women's salaries uh, are increasing or decreasing. So it's kind of an interesting question. Okay, so the same thing here. Like we would be interested in where do they cross, right? Where where is that solution uh, going to happen? And so I'm going to just plop this out here, change the window because we know that it's probably way way out there. Let's set this up to be like 2080 maybe for uh, the x maximum. And so if I go back to my graph, and now I've got these two guys graphed here. Hey, I do see that that intersection happens way, way out there. And I can solve this by doing uh, second uh, calculate. And I can determine an intersection between two functions here. So I'll do that uh, by choosing option number five there. Uh, and I'll hit uh, enter on the first curve and the second curve, select those two. And then my guess should be somewhere close to that uh, to that intersection. So I'll just uh, I'll put that in there and notice uh, the solution that we get here. So 2076 is approximately uh, the year when these two things um, intersect, which is interesting. It's so again that conversation like, do we really want to wait 50 more years for this to be a true statement, or are there some things that maybe we can do differently? Uh, to, to help that and it's worthwhile to have that conversation with my students in the classroom um, to kind of get them thinking about, wow, this is, this is definitely something to be done. All right, so I'm going to really try to wrap up quickly because Gail, I know, is getting ready to give me the hook. So um, I'm going to hurry up and just I'm going to go through the rest of this by, by just kind of talking to this. So uh, I could in my classroom do sort of the standard uh, solution, which would be maybe to get these two equations and then use either substitution or maybe a, a method of elimination, some sort of ability of subtracting these two uh, pieces in my classroom and I could solve that way. It was a, an aha moment for me the other day um, whenever I kind of tried well, what if I do the difference? What happens if I subtract uh, the men's minus the women's and then solve that system of equations uh, for where that system of equation or where that equation rather is equal to zero? And lo and behold, uh, the the place where that where that uh, equation actually ends up being equal to zero. So I'm going to show you. Um, a slide here, a couple of slides here. It turns out that that solution is exactly the same solution uh, that I would have gotten by solving the system of equations. And I know that's a well done to most of us, but that was such a, a, a wow, I've got a graphical solution now to what I usually do uh, with my students in an algebraic method. And I can see the connections between the two. To me, that was just a nice little aha um, that I thought was worth uh, bringing up in this in this context and in this time uh, to be able to give you guys uh, a piece uh, of something to, to think about. All right, so I'm going to do one more thing because this comes up every single time that I that I do this. Um, and yes, Robert, I think this is going to be fascinating whenever we start to look at the data from these last two years as compared to, uh, you know, the previous 20, 15 years. So I think that is definitely worth uh, some interesting conversation. But this is something that comes up every single time I, I share this data with folks. And that is, have you ever gone through and looked at this uh, based on race? And so the answer to that question is, is now yes. Um, and so here is that same data. So on the left-hand side is the total women and total men's data, that first two column, first three columns, that's the data that we were just playing with. But then we have it broken down by race as well in the in the next set of columns. Um, and just so that you guys can know, you can do this on Inspire too. You can play with Inspire. Uh, I actually pulled this data into Inspire um, and made uh, a similar scatter plot where now I've got everybody uh, on the same plot. And it gives you some real perspective uh, to be able to have some conversation with uh, students about what's going on. Uh, in this graph and what are some things some takeaways for us uh, to be thinking about as we look into the future and as we talk about what salary gap is and what salary gap uh, should be um, based upon these two things. So there was women's 
uh, salary gap and here's men's salary gap. What do you notice are things that are the same? Uh, what are you noticing the things that are uh, maybe different uh, between these two? Um, and then I'm going to put up one more uh, table here because now I know Gail is ready to, to pull me off the off the line here. Um, and that is if we just pull all of that back together and we say, okay, we're looking at the ratios. Um, if you look at the trend from 1960 on versus the trend from 2001 on, we get some incredibly different things. So what are some things that you notice and wonder? And maybe that's what I'll end with um, here for you guys to kind of think about uh, with your students, something to go and play with. I know we didn't have enough time to play, play enough, but uh, hopefully this was enough to get you guys started thinking about uh, what you could do with your students. So Tom or Mike, I guess, you can uh, pass the buck over to Tom. And while you're doing that, maybe I'll try to answer questions that pop up in the chat or comments or thoughts. Okay. Thanks, Curtis and Tom, you should have control. Okay, so I'll uh, do my best here and see if I can uh, share my screen. Uh, hopefully you all are seeing a, a slide in our PowerPoint talks about floods in the news. Um, so this has really been in the news quite recently. Um, in fact, it, it hitting a tremendous different number of areas of the country. Uh, of course, we know the, the uh, hurricane that hit the Louisiana coast a few weeks ago. Uh, and folks have been talking about how the General sea level rise is going to it's predicted to double the flood frequency on the Louisiana coast. Uh, in fact, this idea of a hundred year flood, a flood that happens on average once in a hundred years, those seem to be happening more often. So we might need to change the, the name of that term. Um, the Philadelphia region has hit up to 10 inches of rain uh, and a hundred year flood Monday. And it, most likely won't be another 100 years before they have another rain like that. Uh, so in general, we're, we're seeing this a lot in headlines. Uh, and floods are uh, natural disasters that require responses. And um, how we respond to those responses is a problem that we can look at and think about using data. So let me uh, move to this next slide. and. Uh, what we did uh, was take a look at some census data, and we looked at the uh, a flood that happened a few years ago. This is Hurricane Sandy, and that hit the uh, New York area. And we took a look at uh, some problems that happened on Staten Island. So they, uh, in preparation for that hurricane, they were anticipating a storm surge. And they had a limited number of generators available that they could use to serve regions that lost power. And also, if the flooding was bad enough, uh, they might have to evacuate people, especially people who were uh, might not have access to transportation uh, or were vulnerable in other ways, people living perhaps in assisted care facilities. And so the question is, considering all these different factors, all these different variables, what, where should they locate the generators and where should they uh, position those evacuation buses uh, so they could uh, make the best use of them? Um, so, for example, uh, would it make the most sense for them to concentrate the resources on the eastern shore of the island. Now, the eastern shore of Staten Island is the one where the water, it is an island, but the, the water on the west side is, is a river. On the east side, it's uh, more ocean facing, and so it's more susceptible to that storm surge. So that's a question that we wanted to look at uh, and make use of uh, TI technology uh, to be able to look at it in some interesting ways. 
so here um, what we have is this, this this data might look a little bit overwhelming uh, but what we have is the census tract so on that map of staten island there are these, these separate tracts and these numbers I'm, I'm really not sure where the numbers come from that label the census tracts there's probably some historical um, reasoning behind that uh, but with each census tract, we have uh, some data, the number of city blocks within that census tract, how high above sea level that tract is on the average. And then we have some demographic information that was particularly important to look at uh, in this instance. So we're looking at the percentage of people in the tract, what percentage of the population was greater than or equal to 65 years old. And we can also look at the raw number of people uh, over greater than or equal to 65. Uh, we could look at folks that are older than that number greater than or equal to 75, the actual population. Uh, and there's other demographic data that's related to race and ethnicity. Uh, so this is a big spreadsheet of data uh, that we could take into consideration in trying to decide where to, to put our generators and our buses. So um, if you just did a wild guess, you can imagine what kind of mess that would be. And it turns out that you can really do quite well uh, if you look at the right data and think carefully about how to position these. Uh, so this, um, census tract data for Staten Island, you can see on that screen, uh, kind of in the lower right, uh, that's a TI Inspire screen. And what's been done there, we, what we've done is create a TI Inspire file, uh, which lets you deal with uh, named lists in a, in a really nice spreadsheet format. And you have all the same kind of functionality you would have with a spreadsheet uh, like Excel or whatever. Um, for example, here, uh, the certain rows have been selected and colored that satisfied a criteria that uh, had to do with elevation. And then uh, other, uh, if you'll notice in some of the cells are colored blue, uh, those were cells that were selected based on the population demographic. Uh, how many people over 65, 65 or older were in that uh, track. Uh, so uh, kind of taking a spreadsheet and making selections of combinations of characteristics that are going to be relevant is a way to um, uh, use this data. Um, but the, this question of where to put things, uh, these tracks are in, in locations. Uh, what we wanted to do was take this data and have a chance to look at it in a visual way using an actual map. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch over to the TI Inspire and show you what we came up with. All right. And my fellow panelists can let me know if I've uh, fouled up here. Hopefully you're looking at uh, TI Inspire screen. And That's good, Tom. Okay, great. Uh, so this is that uh, uh, Inspire file, and that's on the TI website. Um, it's uh, on optimizing resources using census data. And the example we're using here is that Staten Island uh, data. Uh, so um, on one of these pages here, you can see that we have exactly the data you saw before. It's already been entered in. Uh, we've got the track numbers, the number of city blocks, the elevation above sea level, so on and so forth. Uh, but what's really nice about this file is we've taken it and used that data to create an interactive colored map. So what we did was we recreated the map of Staten Island, and for each track on that map, we have a conditional coloring scheme. And so you can set a, a threshold on the elevation. So if the elevation is below a certain level, it, the tract will be colored green. 
And if the number of seniors, 75 or older, is bigger than a, a, a specific number, you can color those tracks orange. And then you can color tracks that satisfy both of those criteria, magenta. And those that don't satisfy either criteria will, will just leave as gray. So let me take a look at this map so you can see what we're talking about. Okay. So this is that map of Staten Island, and uh, this was uh, took a little while to create. So every one of those little tracks is a polygon. This was been created in the geometry uh, environment. Uh, but what's really cool about Inspire is uh, a polygon. You can actually make the fill color conditional on some logical expression, and the logical expressions uh, that are uh, underneath this map are tied to the data in that spreadsheet. So, for example, here, uh, I've got a little slider and right now it's set at the threshold of 300 people. If the number of people in your track that are 75 years or older is greater than or is 300, excuse me. If uh, you have at least 300 people that are 75 or older in your track, it's going to color it orange. Over here, this is the threshold for a kind of the maximum elevation. So if the elevation of the track is under 25 feet above sea level, it's colored green. And then the magenta ones are those that satisfy both of those criteria simultaneously. So if I lower this threshold on the age number of people that are 75 or older, that should provide more tracks that are colored orange. And you can see as I ratchet that down, and I should have said either orange or magenta, okay? Uh, if I lift that threshold, we see fewer tracks satisfy that criteria. Similarly, if I lower the maximum elevation, it's going to be harder for a track to satisfy that. And notice here, some of these tracks that are colored green, but not magenta. Well, these are actually in an industrial area of the island. And so they don't really have that big a population. Okay. So it's, if we only use the elevation alone, yes, these things are gonna be susceptible to flooding, but the, the, the real thing we need to respond to is the, the human tragedy is, is getting people in safety. And so that's why we would want to look at criteria like this, like the number of, of seniors that are in the track. Okay. So this was a way to use that spreadsheet and you could uh, experiment, students can play with different scenarios and then make some judgments about where they would want to position their generators and, and put their fleet of buses. Now we kind of continued on with this. I'll just uh, I'll wind this up very quickly because I want to give uh, uh, Gail uh, time to talk about uh, her piece here. Uh, but we have another map where we uh, incorporated more variables, uh, population density, that would be people per square block, a total population, elevation again. And then, so using those three data points, just population density, total population, and elevation, then we could look at combinations. So green here would be both the population elevation criteria were met. Red would be density and elevation criteria met. Orange population and density met. And brown would be all three criteria met. Uh, so this is just a similar map, except now we have three different sliders for uh, population density, total population, and elevation. Uh, and brown here is that's all three criteria, but you can see there are other colors here. I'd have to go back and look at the key, but I can again play with these thresholds in different ways. Get the different colorings here. Uh, this uh, one that's blue, but that's all it is. Uh, this was highly industrial, very little population in this track here. Uh, these brown ones are ones with high population density, high populations, and low elevation. 
So again, uh, this is trying to put that data in a form where students can easily uh, play with these thresholds and then make some decisions uh, based on that where they could put their limited resources. Okay, I think that about winds up my time. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, go back to the PowerPoint. And I'm going to uh, stop sharing, or I'll just ask Mike if he can pass the ball over to uh, Gail and let her go with her piece. Thanks, Tom. Okay, Gail, you should have control now. Thanks. Um, I am going to share my screen, I think. Um, and you should be looking at actually the last slide that comes from Tom's um, discussion about the floods, which is the wrapping up part where the kids try to explain and make sense um, of what they have just gone through in the activity. Um, and so I'm going to play from current slide. And go to the next one and I'm going to switch. So the 1st, 2 activities really were kind of societal. Um, and things that were important for us as members of a society to think about and to look at the data. The. Activity that I'm going to share with you is important from another reason. Um, I, I have to say, I gave my grandson um, these problems when he was like 18, 17 years old, 18, I guess, and all of them and asked which one he wanted to do. And he wanted to do this one um, that we're going to look at right now. So this one is a curiosity and kids are motivated and interested in something. Um, they're more apt to pay attention to the mathematics. So that's what this one is. So this is the game of hog. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the game of hog. Um, these are our rules that we made for the game of hog. Um, and I just want you to look at it, read it. And then if you can choose to toss anywhere from one to seven dice, what number of dice would you choose to win the game? So type it in the chat. Oh, I'm seeing five sixes. Threes. All right. And so my next question is, what would you do to get evidence for your claim? And one thought might be to simulate it, but Let's leave aside the kind of theoretical approach to this and just think about are there ways that you might be able to simulate this throwing of the dice so that we could figure out if your estimates, your threes, your fours, your fives, what are you sensing that? Um, do the actual dice. So now let me just see if I can do this little control tab thing that lets me go to my inspire and Whoops, that didn't go to my Inspire. All right, there we are. So here's the game of Hog. And um, Leslie said actual dice. So you're right. Remember our little framework that Curtis talked about is to actually try to do something that is accessible. So basically when I do this, I have kids work in pairs and they compete to see who's gonna win the game. It has been known that the kids um, at some point, often they say, oh, this is not getting us in the answer fast enough. Let's all join our groups together and you do toss one die and you toss two. So they kind of um, spin it out and I guess that's okay um, because they're pretty interested in what they're doing and they're trying to figure out who's gonna win. So, we're going to look at a simulation. Um, I'm going to set, okay, a RAND. I'm going to define this as die one. And I'm going to say it's random integers. 
from one, I'm going to say equals by an int one comma six comma 25. And I'm going to say the game just goes till 25. Okay. Oh, it didn't like that. Oh, that's because I had two equals. I'm always doing things like that. And then when I get rid of that, now oh, the whole thing went away. Let's start over. Equals ran int one comma six comma 25. And we're going to generate that. And now I have my random integers. And this is basically, um, I'm going to call it guy underscore one. Okay. And so my question is, well, what is the sum of those those faces? If I just toss one die 25 times, what's a likely score that I might get? That's what I'm going to ask. So I'm going to go equals sum I underscore one. I get 89. But I have to remember that as I scroll through, I'm going to pick up a, a six. So there's two sixes. So those sixes don't count. So I'm going to use a function uh, finality. Now, remember how we talked about trying to go through this um, kind of easily and informally at the beginning? I have not a problem if the kids just go through this and scroll down and count how many sixes. But we can also actually, after they've done that a couple of times, we can show them this little count if. So it's a count if, and it's going to be die underscore one, comma, question mark, equals six. So I'm just going to count how many, now what did I do wrong? I forgot the equals, I suppose. And so there were four sixes in those 25 tosses. So now I know that I have to get rid of four sixes from this 89. So the kids can do it manually or they can do this um, by making this automatic by saying, let's define this as um, score colon equals. And I'm going to say it's going to be um, B1. That's in cell B1 minus six times what's in cell B2. And that says 65. Now, again, the kids can do this by hand. It's not a problem. They can use the random number generator and then they can just look at the numbers. Um, but after a while, kids really want to make this go a little bit faster. So that's what I'm going to do. So now what I really want to think about here is how could I make this accumulate this? Because I just know I the, the score when I tossed one die was 65. So what would happen if I do it again? Well, the inspire and the and you can actually do this on a 84 as well. Um and sl slightly different commands, but I can regenerate that many times. So I'm just hitting command R and it's giving me a new set of random integers and that new set of random integers is being added and the number of sixes is being subtracted. And I can actually um, control that by looking at um, what I want to do is I'm like, I have this down here as score, remember? Up here, I want to capture that. So I'm going to say equals capture, and I'm going to say score, comma, one. So it captured just the 54. It didn't capture the first two. And I'm going to call this my um, total. Okay. And now when I collect, when I go control R, it's generating new ones and it's capturing each one that I generate. So what would you guys like to do next? Anybody got a thought? I want to see a picture, Curtis says, to die. 
I want to do both of those things to die and the picture. So let me actually do a split screen and do what Curtis says. I'm going to do a split screen and over here, I'm going to do data and statistics. And I have a lot of variables in here, so I'm going to pick die underscore one. And notice that's what it looks like. And as I go over here and go control R, I'm getting a distribution of the typical scores that happen when I toss one die. Now I can go back over here and I can actually go, let's look at the window because it just set the window up at the very beginning. So I'm gonna go Windows, Zoom Data, and that didn't change, so that was good. And then I'm gonna look and see if I can analyze. I'm gonna plot value and I'm gonna look for the mean. One way, let's try that again. Analyze plot value. I want mean. Where is it going? Why is this not working? Analyze plot value mean parentheses die underscore one. And that will give me the mean of that distribution. And as I continue to go and add values in there, that mean will slightly change. But it sticks somewhere around the four, we'll go maybe around three point something or other. So, So Curtis says I should change it to totals. He's right. Actually, die one. Let me do totals. All right. Thanks, Curtis. And you can see what it looks like. And we're finding the mean not, not of die one. We should be finding the mean of the totals. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go look over here at one that's already worked out for you. And I'm going to look at the next question, which is what Megan wanted to know is what happens if we do two. And you can see what it looks like. Okay. And so I'm going to do exactly the same thing I did before. I'm going to generate one die two die, and then I'm going to get the sum, just like I did before. But I now I have two numbers that I have to worry about. And I have to be careful that I don't have a six, because I, then I have to, that zeroes out my total. So I have to be careful to get rid of that six to zero it out. So I'm going to use another command. Um, I do the capture command, but I'm going to, here, I'm going to look at this cell and I'm going to use a when command. And that when command is going to give me the um, values that will allow me to actually um, subtract out the values for when I don't want that. Um, the sum of the six. So this mean here of the, the scores will give me the answers that I'm looking for for look, tossing two dice. And I can go ahead and I can do the very same thing where I toss three dice and look at that, um, do the very same thing, figure out my capturing and look at what I have. I can continue to generate again, add more onto there to see what happens. And I can repeat this process for all of these, all these values. I can also calculate the standard deviation just so I can get a sense of what it looks like. And I can do that with every combination of dice. And so that will get me um, to a little ending thing that looks like this. So now here I have this, set of data, but I didn't really get a lot of distributions. 
and I could continue to look more. And it looks like, oh, it looks like four and five and six are relatively good. Maybe I need to do some more. And essentially, I can play with this in all sorts of ways. The kids do all sorts of things to think about it. And I want to share with you um, just what the, um, this is a little program that Tom actually wrote, I think. And it actually looks at the theoretical distribution. And if I go here, look here, this is the graph of the theoretical distribution. And you notice that if I use trace, and I use graph trace, as I trace this up, you notice that four is 5.79, five is 6.03, and six is 6.03. So either five or six is going to work to give us the, um, the maximum value if you look at the theoretical thing. Not all my kids actually get there, I have to tell you. Um, but I don't know why that does that. Um, I want to go to my PowerPoint. And I have to share with you that I gave this for the kind of summary thing. I gave this to my 18 year old grandson and this is what he did. So he decided to write a computer program. He did it in Python. He looked at the sample variance. He paid attention to whether the player is behind and needs a big score. And then he compared it to the um, analytical expected value um, about what he did. Now, I have to tell you that no other student I've ever had has done that, but it's kind of a cool thing to do. So my students have had lots of fun with this. I think yours would too. So we did an earlier webinar, Tom and I, with some more activities about um, herd immunity and screening tests that you can get and on the TI website. And these resources are all available on um, in the Math Inspired and the TI-84 Activity Central. And there are four categories that you might want to look at them. Um, and by the way, Curtis is pointing out that the um, Python coding ability, my grandson did not do this on, um, he did it on something else. We did not do it on an Inspire, but he could have. Um, so that would be kind of a cool thing to be able to do. So thank you. Um, these are our email addresses in case you want to contact any one of us. And I'm going to turn this back to Mike, who can wrap it up. Awesome, Gail. Thanks so much. So as promised, uh, one lucky winner tonight is going to receive a TI graphing calculator. And tonight's lucky winner is Richard Daughtery. So Richard, congratulations. We'll be in touch over email in the next couple of days, Richard, uh, to give you a little more information about that. But big congrats. To receive a certificate of attendance, I'm gonna have you click the link in the chat window in a few seconds. There we go. Also listed as a link for the documents that Gail, Curtis, and Tom used tonight. And if you're having trouble getting those links, uh, just hang tight, you'll automatically get a follow-up email in a couple days. And that follow-up email contained links to the documents, their certificate, as well as the recording. So you can pause and rewind and really go through this at your own pace. And if you're watching this on demand, go ahead and copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate. After the webinar, uh, again, if you have any content specific qu questions, feel free to get a hold of Gail, Tom, or Curtis. Um, and if they're not content specific, uh, feel free to give us a call at 1 800 TI Cares or TI Cares at TI.com. We'd love to hear from you. Speaking of hearing from you, when you leave the webinar tonight, a brief survey will automatically appear in your browser. Your feedback guides us as we plan future online events. We really hope you share your thoughts. 
big thanks to Curtis, Gail, and Tom for sharing uh, some real problems that do matter. So thanks so much uh, to the three of you for putting all this together. And Welcome, thanks, Mike. Thanks for having us. Thanks, yes, thanks Curtis. Thank you, guys. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. We hope to see you back online next week. Have a great night and stay safe.